What's up, everybody? Episode 66. It's a Sunday morning. So, um, recently, I've been questioning a bit whether I want to continue doing this podcast as, as it has been done. Um, takes a lot of time. I've done, this is my 66th one. I like it, but is it, is it important anymore? So I've been questioning it a bit. But I'm going to start off with a uh, thank you to my my buddy Tim at um, Lake Country, who sent me a text, I don't know, Saturday morning, I think. And like I said, I've really been questions why I haven't put many out lately. But he, he was responding to my last podcast, or one before, where I had this really stupid conversation, thanks to my nephew Tristan, about if uh, fluid fingers, if you could have one liquid or something shot out of your fingers for the rest of your life <laughs> so it's, it's really dumb and if you haven't heard that one you probably don't want to because um, i like dumb conversations like that so he he sent me this text early in the morning that what his choices were um and it entertained me and reminded me sort of, of why i do this so i still may delay doing it or change it a bit but um tim added coffee to his which i can't i i can't believe I didn't add coffee to mine. I'd probably have to get rid of something. We were similar on some stuff, but my favorite one he added was um, sc <laughs> scorpion venom, with, which I never, I'm not sure I've ever said those two words or thought about scorpion venom before, but apparently it's one of the most deadly substances on earth. And Tim said he could use it to kill all of his enemies which i like the vindictiveness and the grudge holding of that it also apparently is 39 million dollars a gallon not sure who's buying scorpion venom but anyway and then i asked him wouldn't it kill you it's coming out of your fingers like you're bound to get the wind blows it back or you're bound to get it but apparently science nerds like him know that the way to beat um venom like that is to be um to to have very very small amounts of it over a period of time to become immune so apparently he's got a superpower and he can be immune to it so scorpion venom will be shooting out of tim's fingertips soon um nuts and bolts the little stuff i like to get over i think the argument that I get a lot with pickleball and tennis. Tennis players telling me all the time that tennis hurts their pickleball game. It's a conversation. Um, I've, I've really never agreed with that, um, but I think the argument's over. I had a player yesterday come back from Florida for probably three weeks. Um, Ed, been a friend and student of mine for honestly almost 20 years, just after I moved here. Um, Played pickleball the whole time. Pickleball and golf. Absolutely no tennis. And he came back and his skills around the net from a control and touch and drop shots and, and spins and just being able to stay patient in those, those smaller battles at the net, hitting at people's shoes was just, it was significantly better. He was already fairly good at it, but significant. And to me, the, the argument in my mind's over. You play, go play pickleball for two or three weeks. You're coming back with some new skills um, about how to handle your racket and uh, especially decision making. So if you're still in that, I won't play pickleball because it'll hurt my tennis game. You're wrong and I am right. And because I'm the only one sitting in this room, you cannot argue with me. So I win that battle. But find another reason not to play. You may not play because you don't like the people or whatever it is, but don't make it because it'll hurt your tennis game. That's, um, it's just silly. Um, Australian Open finished in the middle of the night. I did not watch a single second of Medvedev and center. I chose sleep. Um, I watched some highlights, looked like a heck of a match. I think sounds like Medvedev's um, five setters previously and the amount of time he was on the court came back to getting. There's no timer in tennis, and he just couldn't maintain it for one more set. But center's a beast. I think he's the second youngest to win a Grand Slam, maybe third. 
Um, love Medvedev now. Used to hate his guts. I just like watching him play. I think he's funny afterwards. Um, center sounds like he'll be around for a while. Medvedev spent played 31 sets, which broke the record for most sets ever played in an Australian Open. Maybe a Grand Slam. He broke the record for most hours on court at a at the Australian, and it eventually, as good as athletes as they are and highly trained, it looked like it came back to get him. Um, Sabalinka, I really like. I I got to see her on the Netflix doc Breakpoint quite a bit, and I, I think she seems like a decent person. Um, doesn't behave poorly from what I've seen. Um, so two two good champions. It's just it's just a bummer for people like me who are old or work um, that you really can't watch a whole lot. Like the final, I think, started at one thirty or two thirty in the morning, and I'm just not there. I couldn't do it if I if I tried to stay up that late. I couldn't do it. And then I'm really not a watch things over person, except I did watch the Colts. Super Bowl in 2006, where they beat the Bears a few times. I've still got it on my, recorded on my TV somewhere. Um, but anyway, I hope you all got a chance to watch it. Next one up, French Open. I think that's April, May-ish, something like that. And uh, it'll be another good one. But hope you all got a chance to see some of that. Um, this one came from my, my friend Brad Seeger, um, tennis coach, teacher, overall smart dude um he wanted me to ask about talk about the two-handed backhand versus double-handed because a lot of the broadcasts are calling it double-handed and i've always been a two-hander um that's just the terminology i grew up with so i prefer two-handed double-handed seems a little obnoxious or arrogant or british <laughs> that i just call british people obnoxious and arrogant i think i might have it just seems a little classy, like old school, um, put on your white dress and your white outfit and wear pants to play in type of thing. Um, so I'm going to stick with two handed Brad. You can uh, someday I'll have you on here and we'll weigh in. The other one he brought up, I think, is a big conversation that I'm not going to touch much. Um, prize money for men and women. So I looked it up and 50 years ago, 1973. The U.S. Open became the first major to pay the men and women equally. Um, the next one, Australian, didn't start until 2001. So 28, yeah, 28 years later, the next major started that. And then the French Open and Wimbledon started in 2007. So right now, all four Grand Slams are equal prize money for the men and women. The Italian Open, which is a big, big tournament, uh, the women get paid less than half of what the men get paid. Cincinnati, the Western and Southern, is about half of what the women make of what the men make. Um, the argument, obviously, is three sets versus five, but in the Grand Slams, they're really the only ones they are playing five. That's equal. Uh, everywhere else, they're playing the same amount, two out of three. And all the other, all the other events. Um, I don't really know. I I used to argue, definitely the men should make more because they're playing longer. They have to do more to earn their money. And to me, business wise, the more you do, the more you make. But as I've gotten older, slightly smarter, definitely not more mature. Um, I see the value of the women's tour from marketing, personalities, selling the sport. There's a numbers to be put on that, and I'm not smart enough to know what they are. But it just it seems a bit half. Even the ones that are less, it seems a little little bit wrong to to it. For like the Italian Open, you're gonna pay you're gonna pay Joker a million. To win it and you're going to play Sabalinka half a million to win the same tournament playing two out of three um so i don't know i think eventually they'll all get up to the same but there's got to be some smart people who are watching the how much they get for advertising commercials all those things um, i think i'd lean towards 
we're all coming to the same place. We're all filling stadiums. It'd be a whole lot easier in the world if everybody just made the same. Move on to more important things. Um, so I don't really. I, I'd say I'm I'm neutral. The three out of five, yes, they play longer. But does that mean they're providing less of a product? I don't know anymore. Ask me ten years ago, I'd say I'd probably lean towards yeah. It's, it's I watch more men's tennis than women's. And I don't know if that's true anymore. Um, but think about it. If you've got comments on it and you think I'm a I'm a jackass for my thoughts. Feel free to comment anywhere or just text me. Everybody listening to this knows how to find me. Um, so the next thing on it, and, and I don't have, I'm going to get into things on my mind, but uh, I'm on this job listing site. And obviously if I'm doing this, I've been in the tennis career now for 35 years a long time and and you see things and a job posted last night um, there's a job listing that you can get on facebook or other places it's free so this job had this long requirements that looking for a tennis coach a head tennis professional was the title and they basically tell you you have you're required to be on court 40 hours a week you've got to teach 40 hours of tennis per week you have nights, evenings, weekends, holidays, and you have to provide your own equipment, own tennis balls, carts, hoppers, you name it. $85,000. Sounds pretty good for maybe a small town in Indiana or Wisconsin, but this is Santa Monica, California, one of the most expensive places to live. $85,000 gets you jack. I've been to Santa Monica for one day, one afternoon. Annie took us. Um, you can't get a cheeseburger for less than 15 bucks. You can't live on $85,000. And this place calls itself a tennis academy. And this academy doesn't provide equipment or tennis balls and is going to pay you 85 grand in a place where that is not livable in that area. Um, and you got to teach nights, evenings, weekends. So, it just got me thinking that um, the tennis world's messed up. This is this is probably standard for paying coaches. It's a low bar. Um, it's why coaches leave a lot and don't stick around much is because they're looking. They can't. They have to look for the next thing. But um, I just thought that was insane. And that's what we battle is. The, um, I think a lot of tennis coaches, directors have been just devalued, um, not not made to feel super important. You put me on the court for 40 hours a week, make me buy my own stuff and work nights, evenings and holidays. You better pay me 850,000. 85 is not going to cut it. It's a big number. Again, I, I, um, it's where you live and what you're asked to do. That's not a big number for that, that kind of job. Um, and it got me thinking about an article I read recently that was sort of proposing the question, should tennis directors, golf directors, um, training directors, should the people that are driving the business and front facing to the members, should they be making more than their general managers and owners? Are they more important because we're the ones that are generating income every day, all day? I found it interesting and I was surprised that someone in the industry actually said it out loud and wrote it and put it out there. Um, because if you think about it that way, most tennis clubs, they are driven by the relationships between members and coaches and the programming those coaches put on. And they provide a lot of value. And I just think, I think it's worth thinking about, right? Um, there's some great GMs. I, I work for one. I'm not just trying to keep my job, but, um, that deserve a lot, but should it be equal? Should there be a system where the golf and tennis person actually make equal or more than the general manager who isn't necessarily in most cases standing on a tennis court, creating programming, creating members? It's an interesting topic, and I, I agree a bit. There's some there's some coaches out there that are just so freaking good that people come to that club because of them. 
hundred percent. I am, I've been super fortunate in my career that I've got people who have followed me around as I lost jobs and moved to different clubs and found a great home now. And I'm still fortunate to work with people. And, um, it just shows that coaches are, they're business drivers. Um, and I think it's uh, just an interesting topic. Like I said, I'm just rambling about things. Uh, Madden football. So I had this thought. I like to make up dumb stuff when I teach a lot of analogies. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But um, So I, I'd say I teach tennis fairly conservative from a strategy standpoint. Put the ball in play. Put people. Uh, put your opponent in position to screw up. Because I think that's easier than the player being amazing. It's far easier for me to get my opponent to make a mistake or a bad decision than it is for me to do amazing things. And I was thinking about Madden football. And if you're my age, you grew up on Madden football, especially the guys. It was the game. It's all I really played. It was Madden all the time. And in Madden football... You take a lot of risks, you play differently, meaning you don't really punt. You go for it on fourth and everything, and it could be fourth and 20. You're throwing a Hail Mary. You're not punting, you're fake punting, fake field goals. They used to have this awesome play called the halfback toss and pass where you hike it to the quarterback and then he throws it to the halfback. Who throws it back to the quarterback, one of those cool plays. And we would always try it and it would always fail, but it was still cool. Um, there was just, you know, it's a video game. You're the, you're the coach and the player, low risk or, or high risk. And I don't play, I don't play tennis that way. And I also didn't play Madden that way. And I think it's why that video game may have shaped how I coach. So I'll tell you the story of I've played my brother Mark in Madden thousands and thousands of times. And I'm probably never lost. But the way I would play it is I played Madden straight up like I was Bill Belichick or Nick Saban. I followed the rules, uh, ran when I was supposed to, ran a lot, let the clock go, tried to hold on to the ball, um, rarely did anything stupid. Uh, kind of boring. Kind of, I, I treated it as real football. What would a real coach do? Well, my, my, my brother Mark, he treated it as the fun way. A video game and I knew every time we played if I just did the smart things followed the rules didn't go for it on fourth and 15 punted all that stuff eventually he would make a mistake a dumb one all right he'd go for it when he shouldn't he'd try a trick play um something it would just be some ridiculous thing and, he, and that would hand me the game that's how it that's how it ended He's going, he won't listen to this, but that's how it would, um, that's how it would go down. I could be conservative and just wait and wait and wait for him to make a mistake. It's kind of how I teach a little bit. Although I add staying aggressive in the right moments and attacking, but I think it's better for most, most club players to take their time, be patient, make your opponent hit a bunch of shots from difficult places and watch them crumble and fall apart and let the amazing things just show up because they will, they will show up just by hitting enough balls. Good things are going, going to happen. And I think Madden style is not the greatest way to operate on a tennis court. It didn't work for Mark crushed him all the time. He might've beaten me once. And if he hears this, he's going to tell you something about me owing him a hundred dollars for something, and it's just not true. He's he's got he's older than me. He's lost his he's lost his memory a little bit. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. So um, that's kind of my stuff. But so I mentioned earlier that I was struggling a bit with um, whether I'm going to continue this, and I still don't know. Um, uh, I, it, it's a lot, even though I like now I'm down to a couple times a month, once every two weeks, I still want to find a way to get my 
thoughts out. I just don't know if this is the right way. So recently, I keep hearing this word people use. It must be the buzzword in business called pivot, pivoting. Something happens. We need to pivot. It's the right word. I just don't like saying it. I think it makes me sound um, like I'm trying to be something I'm not. But recently, and I've posted some of these on Facebook and Instagram and all those things you can find me on. A lot of pictures from my past. A picture recently this week was me at 21 years old working for the YMCA in Vincennes, Indiana. Teaching, a, I think she was 10 years old, teaching tennis at the Y. Um, there's been high school pictures of me. There, one popped up today of me 12 years ago at Pleasant Valley after, with, with my brother and my buddy Rob. Um, after I put on a, uh, a presentation for the coaches, it's really got me thinking lately about my past, how I got here. When did I become the old one? I've noticed, I've been thinking more and, and noticing when I'm on court that my career it's, it's changed. I, I can still remember clearly. I was the young, new, fun, um, big ideas coach grinding out to find my way. And now I realize that I'll be talking to adult students and realize that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm older than you. And I, it's new to me. I don't know if it's bothering me. I don't, I'm not like sad about it. I don't think this is my midlife crisis. Maybe it is. Maybe I need to go get a sports car and do all that kind of stuff. But it's just got me thinking about how I ended up here and, um, is this my last thing? Do I have anything left in the tank as far as another career path? Is there something else I want to do? Um, I'm definitely, I'm obviously, I'm turning 50 April 25th, so I'm not far from that. So this might be totally normal. I've just never done it before. But it's got me thinking about, you know, how far I've come to get here. Did I do it right? Am I still relevant? All these things, so... I was texting this morning with my friend Jane about how, and she made some comment that I was secretive and she was just kidding. And I realized that I'm really not secretive anymore because you can listen to my podcast and I tell you all the stuff I'm thinking. Um, and I just, a lot of it is just what's, do I still want to do this podcast as it stands? And I think I do. I enjoy it when I'm doing it. Um, but I, I really just wanted to tell three stories about, because I we had a meeting last week at the WAC, and I got to learn some things about people that I didn't know about their sort of their backgrounds and um, how I ended up as a doing what I do as a sort of people facing, leading, standing in front of lots of people. Um, and I told this story. There's, there's really three things that impacted why I'm here and why I'm able to sit at this microphone and and talk hopefully somewhat coherently and um, knowledgeable. And those three things, I'm just gonna tell them quickly. My first one, I was, and I've told this on, I've got another, it's not really a podcast anymore. I've only done three or four episodes and it's been over a year, but I've told this story on that one. Um, when I was probably 14, I was, I was a freshman. I know I was a freshman, so I'd say 14, 15. Um, I was super shy. I didn't have a ton of friends. Um, didn't go out much. Not a real social life. Didn't just didn't say much. Um, I went out with a buddy of mine. His name's Justin, and we were uh, we I know we were going to Hardee's, and he hand he hands me a bag of something and asked me if I'd hang on to it while we went in to get burgers or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't know what it is. Just hands it to me. I shove it in my coat pocket. We, we eat that kind of stuff, go back to the car and um, he asked for it back. I hand it to him I'm like, what was that? Why did, why am I carrying it? And it was, it was a bag of weed. And although highly illegal at that time and not as much now, that was one first moment for me because I thought, how cool am I? I just carried a bag of weed into Hardee's and it was in my pocket. And I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever done. It, it's strange, but it gave me a, a small bit of, all right, that was, that was cool. I did something that was, um, brave and I didn't know it. I didn't know, I didn't know what it was or 
what it did and I didn't know anything about it. Um, but that was, that was something that I remember. I still do. I still know that story exactly. He drove a black, um, not a, not a Miata. Um, I'll remember in a second, it was a black car. It was also the first car I realized that had cruise control because none of my cars had cruise control, but that weed story gave me a little boost. Um, second one was again, pretty shy. I auditioned for the school Christmas musical play that put on every year um, without telling anybody. And I got chosen by our choir director, Mr. Snyder, to sing White Christmas at this thing. And it was like a setup. It was just a single song, just me. And it was this army theme of me being in the army. I was in full fatigues and surrounded by like old army equipment and I remember there's like an old grenade box. It was empty. And I, I freaking sang White Christmas in front of a crowd of, in the school theater and didn't tell anybody. I don't think my parents knew until they showed up at the show and saw my name in the, um, in the program. So it was terrible. I can remember it. There is a video of it somewhere my brother has that better not come out again, but it was awful. Um, but again, that, that was a huge thing because I just stood in front of several hundred people and sang a song, just me with a spotlight on me and gave me, uh, I guess, some confidence that I could do it. And it didn't bother me as much that I wasn't very good. Um, that led me into, I did all the musicals and choirs and theater stuff and I loved it and I wasn't very good at it, but I was confident enough to be bad and cool with it. And then the last one was a big one. I auditioned to sing the national anthem at basketball games. And the first time I ever did it, again, I'm not good. I sung the national anthem at a high school girls basketball game. It was a Saturday morning acapella, no band, just me, a mic, and the two teams and the, the fans, which probably wasn't much, but freaking terrifying standing on the gym floor. I did it. I didn't let anybody go. Didn't let my parents go. Um, that's a huge one. And then I did it another time in a boys basketball game and, um, in Southern Indiana where I grew up, boys basketball is huge and it's a full stadium. We had one of the biggest, uh, gyms in the area. And that one I got to do with the full band with my buddy Frika was in the band and a lot of my friends playing and it was terrifying again, not very good. I'd hate to hear that. That would be on one of those, um, like YouTube videos of worst anthems ever. But those three things led me to what I do now. And now I'm far more comfortable in, in front of a large crowd than I am a small crowd. I'd rather, I'd rather speak in front of 500 than have a small conversation with four people. And I think all of us have those events that do what I do probably maybe that didn't come back from the sort of quieter little awkward background, at least that I felt. And I'm saying all this just cause this is my podcast and I'd like to have conversations with people and love to hear your stories. If you're, you're a coach or anything, whatever you do in your life, how did you end up there? Um, I also ended up here cause I sucked at everything else. I played other sports decent athlete, but I wasn't a great at anything, but I realized tennis could do some of these things for me and take me places and, you know, give me some really enjoyable experiences, some really bad ones, um, from a job standpoint. But those, those are my three moments. Do you, do you all have any, if you're listening to this, think about what yours are. Um, if you're my age, 48, 50 ish. Um, did you have any moments where you start thinking about things like I just discussed? And wow, like I saw that picture of me at 21. Um, I'm like, man, that is a long time ago. I sure hope I, I sure hope I taught that girl. Well, I know I tried. Um, I've never really half asked my teaching, but at 21, you're really just hoping you make some money and seeing what you're doing that night. So the picture looked like I knew what I was doing. So if anybody wants to have that conversation or have some coffee with me and talk about growing old, um, I'd be glad to have it, but that's my story. And for whatever reason, I've just been feeling like I wanted to talk about it a bit. Um, and 
have my therapy session on my podcast. So uh, remember, these are also, like I've mentioned, you can follow Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok. I'm posting these videos. I'm just sitting in Annie's room. I'm also wearing a flannel shirt. I asked for a flannel shirt for Christmas because I saw one and thought, that's cool. I've never been a flannel shirt guy, but they got me one. I kind of dig it. It's kind of reddish bluish. Um, so if you want to check out my new flannel shirt, it's pretty awesome. And I am wearing Crocs as we speak too. Um, so that's really all I got. Um, hope everybody's doing well on the court and, uh, I will guess I'll talk to you next time I decide to, uh, spill my guts again. Thanks everybody. Talk to you later.